Hey, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, to our Community Association Legal Open Forum. I'm Jeff Solomon with K. Bender Rembaum, and with me today is from uh, the gentleman from our Orlando location, Alan Schwartzad. Alan, say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. Listen, so, I'm a dad and an attorney. I didn't have a choice. <laughs> Alan, with uh, that mouthful said, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, how long you've been with the firm, and how you can be contacted. All right. Well, my name is Alan Schwartzide, as Jeff mentioned. I am the managing partner of the firm's Orlando office. So K. Ben Rembaum has been around since the 90s. I have not with the firm. I've been around since the 90s, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, I've been back with the firm, actually, and, and that's another interesting story, but back with the firm for just about a year and a half now. Um, we do have offices located in Pompano Beach. That's our main office, as well as Palm Beach Gardens, my office in Orlando, and uh, Tampa as well as Miami by appointment. We're 21 attorneys that only really practice in this one area, representing community associations. So if your community needs any help with any legal matters whatsoever, chances are there's one or 10 people within the firm that have handled that exact situation in the past. Um, we have eight board certified attorneys in this area, which means that the Florida Bar has designated them with that qualification. Another one who is board certified in construction law which means that if you've got construction defects, your community turned over from the developer just recently or within the last few years, those are issues that we regularly deal with within the firm. Um, the bottom line is if you want a one-stop shop that doesn't make you feel like you're just another number and is going to be communicative, which I hear from pretty much everyone yes. that is reaching out to us is an issue with a lot of other firms. I personally, and I can't speak for the entire firm, but I know that they do a great job of it, I have a policy where within 24 hours after you reach out to me, you're at least going to get an, an acknowledgement that I got your email, got your voicemail, whatever it may be, and that I'm on top of it. And usually if it's not, I'm going to get to it today or tomorrow. There's going to be a deadline in there for when I'm setting a deadline that gives you the opportunity to say, well, we kind of need it sooner and I'll get to it sooner. So the bottom line is if, if your community is not working with an attorney like Jeff mentioned, if you need a second opinion, because we don't have any kind of annual fees other than if you're under our special collection retainer program, we don't have any monthly minimums. We're often used as a second opinion option. And then after seeing the level of service and expertise that you get from us, clients will decide that, okay, maybe we should work with KBR on everything. Um, but enough of my little spiel, <laughs> Jeff, mentioned, um, how to reach me within the firm. And in general, the easiest way to reach me is on LinkedIn or via email if it's related to specific community association business. And thank you again. I say this every time we have a webinar and, and anytime I mention it, but my partner, Jeff Rembaum, made sure that my email is very easy, as at kbrlegal.com. Very simple. So that website that Jeff provided, just add as at before that web address and you'll find me. Um, and I can also be reached our, our office number at the Pompano Beach office that you can reach literally anyone within the firm is 954-928-0680. All right, let's go. Let's do it. Let's we have some it. hands up. And Monica, you are going to be first today with your question. Monica, please enable your microphone and ask away. Welcome. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. Um, this is in regards of the elections webinar that uh, we had. What occurs if the entire board of directors expresses a lack of desire to continue and there are no other residents who wish or are willing to nominate themselves for the new board? So let me just clarify, because I it, you cut out for just a second there. Are you saying the entire board has resigned or they just don't want to be on the board anymore? No, let's say that it, elections election day comes and the board wants to resign entirely and there are no other residents who would like to nominate themselves for the new board. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a tough one. My suggestion would be to ensure that at least one of those directors stays on the board to avoid a receivership, because frankly, that's the appropriate next step. If no one wants to be on the board at the election and all of the directors resign, there's really no other option because there's no board to schedule a subsequent meeting. My suggestion would be at least have one person stay on, see if they can appoint other directors. In other words, people that didn't put their name in the hat, 
But after this one director who's left on the board reaches out to the, the community as a whole and says, listen, your options are someone volunteers or we end up in receivership. So that's really okay. the way that goes is, is you try and get someone who's willing to stick around long enough to find other people to stick around. But the bottom line is if all the direct, and to be candid, I had this happen just two weeks ago where all the directors wanted to resign before the election meeting. And I said, just stick around for an extra week until this election meeting is done. And you know, if, if there are new people that are willing to serve, great, they end up on the board. If there's no one willing to serve, then hopefully that one individual is able to find someone who they can appoint after the fact. Another alternative is if you're not able to find anyone uh, at this scheduled election meeting, you can actually continue the meeting for the purpose of locating people who are willing to serve. And during that, let's say it's 30, 60 days before that newly scheduled election meeting, that continuation, you point out, listen, we're going to be off the board. There's only one director left. That director plans to resign in the near future. And if that director resigns and no one is willing to put their name in the hat sooner, and that sooner is the important part, get ready for a receivership that's going to cost you guys a ton of money because basically what you're doing there is paying someone to do what the board should be doing. But you're not paying the cost of having a management company. You're basically paying someone an attorney's rate to sit there and do literally everything that the board and the officers were responsible for doing before. So receivership is something that if it's at all feasible to avoid, you want to avoid it. Monica, I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Monica. And before we go to our next question, Joel, you're on standby. You're up next. Um, if there's anybody who has a question for Alan and you joined us a little bit late, be sure to hit the hand raise icon at the bottom of your screen one time. That'll keep your hand up in the order in which we receive them. We are giving priority to the folks who want to verbalize their questions, and then we'll go to the typed in questions during registration. And Jeff, so, if I can just point out one more thing that, yeah. that we discussed beforehand, there is so much information that pertains to structural integrity, reserve studies, mandatory reserves, and all the other things that, that excuse me, the uh, Florida legislature has required of condominium associations over the last two years. Mm -hmm. Rather than address those issues, which frankly could take a five-hour seminar in and of itself, and frankly, I think that my partners, Mike Bender and Jeff Rambaum, have probably done more than five hours worth of <laughs> My suggestion, check out what Jeff mentioned earlier, which is Rambaum's Roundup, and go look at the legal update. Alternatively, take a look at our legal updates class that's recorded on the website under the resources tab, because frankly, again, I mean, that could be five, six hours in and of itself. And I'd yeah. rather get to all of the Q&A. Any questions that are answered by the Florida legislature, meaning what's in the statutes now, are going to be in Jeff's Rembaum's Roundup update, the legal update, which is, I think, right at the top of the page once you click on Rembaum's Roundup. Um, anything that's not in there, chances are that's because the, the legislature hasn't addressed it yet and it's kind of up in the air and there's really no good answer for it other than we don't like what's in there because it's not really clear. So <laughs> I just want to be clear up front. I never do that. There's never anything unclear in there. Come on. What are you talking about? I'll, I'll put it this way. My favorite <laughs> law professor's famous line was nothing is safe while the legislature is in session. And I have found in my career that that is 100% accurate. So right. anyway, moving along, I just wanted to clarify, we're not ignoring that those issues exist, but frankly, it would take so much of our time today to discuss just those issues that that I think we could do a three hour Q&A just on that just after on that. a webinar. Yeah. And it's been done. Let's, I recommend you take a look at our website instead. Okay. Good advice there. Good advice and lots of great information. Joel, we've enabled your mic. Please unmute yourself and ask your uh, question with Alan. Thank you. Hi, Alan. Very Hi. nice presentation on behalf of yourself and the firm, by the way. Uh, congratulations, you. Jeff. You're out of a job. But uh, <laughs> uh, that's not my question. That was just a statement. The, um, the question has to do with document requests, uh, requests for do official documents. Um, uh, the general question would be, is there any way to limit or um, restrict or, for that matter, forbid um, owners who are using that uh, that that um, right, if you will, to harass and overwhelm and um, 
uh, you, you get you get the picture. I do. Um, but 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 let me just add one little uh, sub subcategory. Would it matter if those owners are in um, are delinquent? Let's call it that way. Let's call it that in payment of assessments to the point where other uh, enforcement mechanisms can be uh, inf you know, can be started against them. But they're one of their um, th one of the options is to use this as a uh, an aggressive. Uh, uh, in other words, for no purpose. Let, let's assume that it's just uh, right. frivolous. Use, telling them you can't have these records as a tactic for basically enforcement of your covenants. Is that what you're getting at? Um, let's put it this way: the the yeah, that's right. And then you they, then they, then they they chase you. Uh, they, they want to chase the property manager. They want to chase the board. They want to. So yeah, that. Let me let me start from the back um, and address your your last point first. You can't put in policies that say someone is not entitled to records because they are delinquent in payment of assessments. Right. However, you can put in place policies, and frankly, you should put in place policies. And in fact, one of the first things that I recommend for every new client of the firm is to put in a policy that dictates how, when, and how frequently, et cetera members can actually request these records. And it could say that any request that doesn't meet that policy will not be considered. So you're basically putting in the time, frequency, and duration of each one of these records inspection requests. One of the things you can do that might address what you're concerned with without addressing the delinquency issue or the violation issue is you can actually have a policy that says you can only request association records once every 30 days. Any additional requests will be disregarded. So you can't ignore every request, but you can point out, okay, well, you've requested four different times in the last month to have access to the records. You're only entitled to one every 30 days, but you have to have that policy in place. It has to be adopted by the board. And most likely you need to provide notice to the members that it's been adopted and a copy of it needs to be accessible in those official records. So that's the short answer is you can adopt a policy, you can regulate how frequently they can ask for it, how much management time they can take up. It's gotta be um, no less than eight hours within that 30 day period, but you can regulate how, when, and how frequently people can access those records. Hey, if you Joel, have multiple... I, Joel, I also mentioned you you followed up that question. Uh, you typed it in during registration uh, about yeah. uh, sus suspension of certain privileges like laundry facilities and such. You want to yeah. follow up on that too? Um, no, I think I, I think we, we uh, we've made some progress on that. And if you want to okay. address it, by all means, go ahead. But but just to follow up on this question, does it matter if there's a group, a small group of, of um, owners who are piggybacking onto each other? and you know conspiring if you will to make life miserable hmm. unfortunately both in, terms of, both in terms of number of requests and the breadth of the requests well keep in mind i don't really care about the breadth of the request because unless you're in um, a condo situation and you're providing access where you have the obligation to provide access in the same method that you maintain the records in an HOA, or if, you know, if you're keeping the records that are not online and it's just boxes in a condo, um, if you're not required to have a website and keep the records there, all you have to produce is all of those boxes of records. You don't have to cherry pick what records these owners are entitled to review. So if you're saying that it just a huge administrative burden on the association that these people are saying, I want access to the financials. Now I want access to everyone's ledgers. Now I want access to every contract of the association. Your response to all three of those requests can be, and it would be legally appropriate to say, okay, the inspection of all association records will be held on this date at this time at this location. And if they don't want to inspect all of the records, too bad. So the association, unless you are providing copies in lieu of an inspection, doesn't have the obligation to cherry pick records just because that's what an owner wants. That's so right. if you're saying that's part of the obligation that is an overburdensome situation for your particular community, 
there's a way of avoiding that, and that's to only comply with the statute. And frankly, that's something that could be explicitly stated in your policy if that's one of the issues you're facing. So if that's a policy that your community doesn't have, you know, you're welcome to reach out to me and we can work on it together. Or if you prefer to work with your current council, that's an option as well. But, you know, if, if you're not, if they're not even suggesting that type of policy and you've been conferring with them on these issues, then that's probably not an attorney that's very well versed in community association law. And it might not be one you want to work with. Thanks. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you, Joel. Uh, David, you're on deck here. Uh, and for those who just joined us, uh, again, you can use the raise your hand icon at the bottom of your screen, hit it one time, that'll keep your hand up and we'll go in the order in which they're received. David, please unmute yourself and the floor is yours, David. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Actually, afternoon. I had a question. We had an issue last night at, at a board meeting. Um, we have a board member who is 90 days late on it's it turns out it's like thirty dollars in bank charges but it's still 90 days late and it's clearly stated in 718 any monetary uh value um so i just want to make and the board did not keep that person out of the meeting is that wrong well, it's not wrong to not keep them out of the meeting, um, but once they are 90 days delinquent, they can be removed or should be removed from office because that's someone who effectively has abandoned their post unless the board decides it's a bank charge. We're going to go ahead and waive it. Um, I, I, I'm trying to look up, frankly, while we're here, I know that there was a change in the statute and I don't recall if it was that all of a sudden now it need that you need to send prior notice before you can remove them or if it's and, and i'm looking this up while we're sitting here just so okay I that's fine but um you know the bottom line is it's it's not a situation where the board should be ignoring this um i i don't recommend that you sit here and say yeah it's fine it, it should be something that this person either pays the board waives the charge or this person's removed what you shouldn't be doing is what you asked about, which is simply saying you're not allowed to attend the meeting. Because keep in mind, even if they're just a member and they've been removed from the board, removed from the officer position, they're still a member of the community and entitled to attend that meeting unless it's closed for some purpose like a legal meeting with counsel or um, you know, a meeting to discuss the uh, right. personnel of the association. HR, yeah. yeah, I meant you know, sit at the table up front. Yeah, there. So a director <laughs> officer, 90 days delinquent, shall be deemed to have abandoned the office, creating a vacancy. So my position is frankly that this person is off the board, but to not give them any kind of notice in advance of that meeting, it's it's not a legal requirement, but I would recommend that you send something to them and say, listen, you owe this $34 or whatever it is. Are you going to resolve it or are you going to be removed from the board? You've got five days to resolve it. Let me be clear, that's bad legal advice because there's nothing in the statute that authorizes that. But from a practical perspective of not having to replace that director, not having someone off the board for specifically this small amount of money, I would give them the opportunity to resolve it. Now, here's the other issue. You've waited three months to tell them about this. So my suggestion is if you're considering this, you probably should have let them know in advance, even though, again, not a legal requirement. But I, I yeah, think it's something that just came to light the day before the meeting by an owner that brought it to the board's attention. OK, well, my my strong suggestion would be to address issues like this in advance. Um, that could be by taking a look every month or two at the association's ledgers for each director. You shouldn't really have to do that. But the bottom line is, if it's an issue that's come up in the past, it might come up again in the future. Right. No, I understand that. I know because the, the like you say, the statute clearly states that as soon as they're 90 days past due, they're off the board. Right. And, and that's I mean, I, I wish there was a better answer, but frankly, there's not. It, it's technically this person's off the board. 
But whether you follow that or give them a day or, you know, give them five hours for all I care to either pay this or they're off the board. Frankly, I think that it's it's not a legal concept, but it's more practically. Be reasonable. Be reasonable. Uh, yeah. It's more reasonable right. to say, I know we didn't mention this. You had absolutely no reason to know about it other than the fact that it's on your ledger for the last 90 days. The other thing I'd verify was that it's been due for 90 days. And and I'm presuming based on what you've said that it is. But th that's my answer is that technically they're off the board. But if you want to reach out and give them a reasonable opportunity to cure the violation, meaning to pay the $34, I don't see any reason that you wouldn't do that other than the fact that legally this person's already off the board. Now, from right. a practical perspective, an alternative is they are legally off the board. You remove them from the board. And when they pay that $34, the appropriate way to handle it would be to reappoint them to the board as a new director. Keep in mind, though, because they've been pulled off, they'll have to retake the board certification class or sign that certificate again. Got it. Got it. So I had put in one other question that I when I signed up. Can I ask that now? Yeah, go ahead. We've got we got we got a lot of time. Go ahead. So um we're at 20 separate, we're one association with 20 separate condominiums. Each one has its own budget. So in one building, two units are coming up to foreclosure. Okay. And they're just finishing up the budget and they're assessing everybody in the building for the delinquency. Now I was under the impression that it's not bad debt until the foreclosure actually happens. Correct, because keep in mind, the, the possible outcome of the foreclosure sale is that a third party comes in, bids in excess of what the association is owed, and instead of the property, the association gets paid in full. Now, keep in mind right. also that even if the association does take title, you know you can treat that as bad debt, but you would also potentially go out there and try and sell or rent out the property. And those are things that we work on with with foreclosed properties, not frequently, but whenever a client needs it. So, do you think that all the owners should be uh, at that that debt should be added on to the owners that are in the building now, their budget for this coming year? I don't think it's wrong to add that as a cautious approach is really the best answer I can give. I, I don't think okay. it's necessary because of the possibility that it won't become bad debt. But keep in mind, the budget is not specifically intended to address those two lot, those two units. You know, if other people aren't paying throughout the year, that bad debt category would also cover them. So I think Got it is. It it's not a bad idea to have the budget cover that issue. Understood. All right. Thank you guys. Have a Merry Christmas and a happy new year. All right. And a like late happy Hanukkah. <laughs> thank you. Same for you, David. Take care. Thank hey, you. Thanks. We have another hand up, Jack, you're on deck. And what I want to do now too, it's important for us to know, uh, you know, even though we, we asked for the questions to be relative, relative, relatively general, because we do not know your documents. Uh, we, you know, so, and this is not to be considered as legal advice, as you know. So uh, when we uh, allow, uh, when we enable your microphones, please let us know the type of association as well as the name of your association. And um, let's go from there. And uh, Jack, please uh, unmute yourself. Jack, uh, what type Hi, of how association? You doing? Hi, Jack. Hi. Um, are you a condominium, an HOA, or a cooperative? We're, we're a condominium. And uh, this is just a general question uh, concerning reserves. Um, you know, we've been pooling our reserve funds, but we've been funding it according to the reserve study. So let's take, for example, we have um, for concrete restoration, we have $200,000 that we put aside, but everything is pooled. So it's in one fund. And since we find out it's going to run more than the 200000 could we take other pool funds and apply it and instead of 200, make it 300,000? Well, I mean, generally speaking, when you have pooled reserves, you can use any, any funds that are in that pool for any asset of the association that's also in that pool. Right. Okay. That was, that, that was my question. Yeah. Okay. Well, then you're Thank welcome. You. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> Just keep in mind, it's only other items that are in that same pool. If you've got three different pools of reserves, you wouldn't necessarily be able to shift 
funds from one pool to the other without a member vote. And again, we're not going to get into the mandatory reserves and um, not being able to move those funds that'll kick in in the near future. Mm -hmm. But that's that's the short answer is if it's in the same pool, use it for whatever's needed. OK, Just right. But, but going forward now with the new uh, laws and everything, that's going to be specific where you can't spend you can't you can't pull those items you can only pull the other items. Correct. Well, that's that's up for debate. I think the statute is written in a way that it could be read where only a straight line method is allowed. But I know that several people, including the DBPR, have said they intend to allow pooled reserves. So the answer is we're hoping for a legislative clarification. That's the best. Thank answer you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Jack. Tony, you're on deck and Tony's uh, going to enable your mic. Please start off with the uh, association type and the name of your association, please, uh, that the question pertains to. Tony. Good afternoon. Um, I'm at King's Court uh, HOA and down in Miami. Thank and you. Uh, my question is about HOAs. And uh, do you know of other uh, ways that people uh, figure out their assessment numbers. Our declaration that was made back in the late 70s, we used the CPI to raise our assessments every year. And I'm just wondering, are there other uh, tools or other ways that people do it? I know we'd have to change documents and I don't, I'm not worried about that. I'm just trying to figure out how do people figure out their raises in their ass monthly assessment year to year? Well, I mean, frankly, the best and easiest, well, not easiest, but the best way to do it is to figure out what you're actually going to spend. So you go to your contractors and if there's any kind of, of unclear term in your contract as to what next year's costs are going to entail, then you'll try and ask them, hey, what's this actually going to look like? If you have expenses that you're anticipating that didn't happen last year, you add those in. So you're basically, and then um, to add to that, if you have, you know, reserves or assets that you haven't specifically accounted for, you might have a reserve study performed. Right. So these are all ways of finding out, okay, what's it actually, and, and keep in mind what the purpose of a budget is. It's not to have money available. It's to have the right amount of money available, at least within the board's estimation. So what is it really going to cost within the board's best guess to operate and maintain the community next year. So you look at all of your assets, all your liabilities, and what is it going to take to do everything the, the association needs in the next year? That should be your budget. It shouldn't just be adjusting for inflation from last year, in my opinion. If you've got assets that were damaged and were repaired and won't need repairs for another five years, you'd be over budgeting if you accounted for those repairs now. Right. Right. You know, it, what, what you want to do is figure out what's it really going to cost. And I understand the question is kind of, how do I do that? And the answer is you look at all your contracts, figure out which ones are just increasing. And instead of increasing by CPI, I understand your bylaws might require that you do that for now. But once you're able to fix it so that it's only what you reasonably anticipate it's going to cost, you go with, okay, well, the contract says it's automatically going to increase by 5% next year. Our budget increases by that 5% for that contracted item. And you do that across the board for every expense that you had last year, and then figure out if there are any new ones you'll have next year or any that you're going to drop off because let's say an asset failed and you chose not to replace it or you replaced it with something more effective and efficient. So I wish I could give you a better idea of, of how to properly budget, but the bottom line is you make sure that you're accounting for what it's actually going to cost to operate and maintain the community next year. Right. And it has to be directly on target, but you just get as close as you can. It's just your best guess. But if you're doing it based on CPI alone, then it's not a best guess. No. If, well, what did the rest of the, the country do this past year? Not what's going on in my area for contracted work in my area and what is what pertains to my particular community, which is yes. the way that it should be done. Thank you, because we've been hamstrung by the CPI and, and people, of course, don't want to spend any extra money. And yet... Um, you know, we have exceeded and we had some money left over that we were able to balance budgets, but with the rate of inflation and all that. So I was just curious to go back to my board and say, you know, the CPI isn't yeah, our I mean, best thing. The, the first thing you'll want to do is look into what it's going to take to amend that provision and, and right. say that the board just decides on an appropriate budget. 
But beyond that, I mean, the other thing you could potentially do is, is have your attorney look into whether what the statutes require would supersede what's in your bylaws. Okay. Probably not, but it's it, it might be worth pursuing if you don't think you can get the amendment accomplished. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you, Tony. Theodore. Theodore looks like he is from uh, Veranda Gardens. And please unmute yourself. Correct. There you go. Veranda Gardens, 700 home um, development in Port St. Lucie. HOA, okay. So I've got, I got first a kind of a quick follow-up question to the earlier one on documentation. If, if you have a community website with all documents, all contracts, everything scanned in there, and owners have access to it, does that meet the, the statute requirement of providing document to uh, to all owners in an HOA generally yes but you'd still probably have to adopt a policy that says they can request it and that an appropriate response to that request rather than ignoring it because they have access would be to say it's all available on the website under your login credentials and then I would add to that statement in the response if you don't have login credentials let us know so we can set them up and if you're not able to access the records in that way, let us know so that we can provide them. That way you're avoiding any kind of fair housing, ADA, those types of issues, and, and you're actively providing the records in the way that the owners need them. Because you, the last thing you want is to get hit with that $500 gift, with what I call the, the automatic damages if you don't provide the records on time. It's $50 a day starting on business day 11 after you receive the request. And if an owner claims, well, I wasn't able to access the records on the website and they didn't respond to my request. You know, the last thing you need is to be hit with that fee. In addition to the attorney's fees and costs that that owner would be entitled to recover. Understood. Uh, again, it has, we, we haven't had any problems with this methodology so far, but I was just wondering, you know, your, your thoughts on that, you know, as, as a follow-up. So yeah, my, and, and, in our site, in our, in our site is uh, ADA compliant as well. OK, well, but keep in mind, that's a separate issue, because the fact that they might be able to access it doesn't mean that if, you know, if it's not necessarily a disability issue. It could be an income issue where someone doesn't have a computer, a tablet or an iPhone. Understood. So I'm, I'm going a little bit beyond that. I'm mentioning that as an example of something that could be problematic. My suggestion, I, I'll reiterate, is to have a written policy that dictates how, when, where, et cetera, for these records inspection requests and explicitly says, you know, we have a form letter that we will respond with if those records are on the website, which from what you're indicating, all of them are. So it's yes. basically at that point, you get the, re the request in, you have an automatic response that just needs to be changed the, you know, the address that it's being sent to. Um, and then, you know, you, you have your attorney prepare all of that documentation for you and you know that you're covered. Okay. So my, Question, question, Wiz, one that uh, has a little bit of an ADA uh, um, tilt to it. So we have a, a resident who has been parking a commercial vehicle in his driveway for six months, which, you know, again, is a no-no in our declaration. And so we warned him once, we warned him twice, and then we find, we find him, brought him to the finding committee, and then he all of a sudden says, well, I have my father-in-law living with us part-time, and so I need to transport him to the hospital um, in, in this van, in my work van. Um, so, you know, and he plays the ADA card. And so my question is, do we have um, the legal right to request some sort of a, a statement from that father-in-law's doctor saying that, he has this disability and needs special transportation accommodations, or can he just play this ADA card on us and we're kind of out of luck? Generally, yes, you can. I mean, if it's not an open and obvious condition, for example, you know, if, if dad's in a wheelchair and the, the van is wheelchair accessible, chances are you're not going to be able to ask questions without getting the association in trouble. Uh, because that's an open and obvious condition and it's clear that this is a vehicle that best serves. But if it's a folding wheelchair or if he's just walking slowly, 
then from my perspective, it might not be quite such an obvious condition that the father has, and it might be something that you can ask more questions about. So that's that's something that I would recommend you get legal counsel for a couple of reasons. One, and almost the most important one, is that if you do what your attorney tells you to do, which you can't get legal advice during this class, but you can yeah. get writing from an attorney of our firm if you're working with us, that gives you the protection of saying, we used our business judgment based on advice of counsel rather than going out and unilaterally deciding this jerk is playing us and we need to, we need documentation to prove that dad actually has a disability that's served by being able to park this van in a way that otherwise wouldn't be authorized. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Theodore. Uh, Kathy, Kathy, you are up next please unmute yourself let us know the name of your association i don't see that one on your registration form looks like a and keep in mind if these are really contentious issues i don't have a problem with you not naming your association but at least tell us whether it's an hoa condo or co-op and right. um you know if if you are a client of ours let us know so that we can be a little bit more careful with how we answer because you never know who else is on this call um there's about 50 people here so just be careful Okay. And, um, I'm a condominium owner, not on the board. It's a uh, 76 units and it's a fractured condo. Okay. Um, during the 2008 era, somebody came along and bought 72 of the 76 units. Wow. And they are running it like an apartment. Our insurance, in fact, this was a question I typed in, uh, the condominium insurance covers probably a couple thousand units, all of which are apartments, except this one condominium. Um, the adjacent apartment property is on the water. They've got, um, they need flood insurance. Of course, all they're doing is dividing it up by numbers and charging us and on top of it, they just refuse to give me information. Um, they're trying to force the four of us who are still around um, to sell out to them. And good for me, bad for them. Hmm. I was one of the original developers. I know it's in the declarations. And every time they come out with something, I send them an email and say, guys, they won't answer me. On occasion, they've turned it over to the attorney. But I'll, I'll give you the most dramatic situation, and that is when this group came in, they took over the amenities, the laundry room, the clubhouse. They shut it down, and they turned it into their rental office. I, I mean, I, I just don't know where to go on, on all this stuff because I have called the, you know, the DP. I always get the, the letters backwards. I apologize. But... <laughs> DVPR. <laughs> and, you know, I got to be candid about it. They don't believe me. They don't believe an association is this abusive with their finances and other things. So yeah. I'm totally open to suggestions other than suing them, which I'd like to avoid. Well, I mean, you might want to avoid it, but frankly, that might be the logical step. What I would suggest is, you know, have an attorney put together a letter of all of the things that they're currently doing wrong, why they're wrong, and let them know that if they don't fix them, you might sue them. I mean, I hate to be blunt, but this is a group of, or at least it's a an owner that has the funds to own all of these units and presumably pay the assessments on them. They're not going to take you seriously until you file a lawsuit. They're going to look at it as, well, she can send all these demands. She can threaten us as much as she wants. But until she actually does something about it, you know, bottom line, what is the DBPR going to do? Send us a fine, force us to comply with what we should have done all along. I, I hate to be blunt, but when you're on the owner's side, the only way to get things done sometime with an association whose counsel is pushing you back, um, if, if they're wrong, is a show of force. Because that's all that some people take seriously and it's all that some people will consider. So I'm not implying that they're doing anything right. I'm not implying that you're not within your rights to push them to do what's right. But the bottom line is, 
based on what you've described, it might take filing a lawsuit. And if you're not willing to do that, then you've got really two choices. You can either stick around knowing that they're going to keep doing things wrong and that you'll have to just put up with it because they've got such an over vast majority of the community seats of the votes, et cetera. They can pretty much do what they want. Um, you know, there are bulk buyer statutes that might apply and that you might be able to look into as to what they have obligations to do that they might not be doing. But again, unless you're willing to enforce that, your other alternative is to sell your unit and live somewhere. Are the bulk bu excuse me, are the bulk buyer statutes outside of Chapter 718? No, they're, they're in 718. They probably won't do much to help you because they're largely related to the obligations. But if, again, it's yet another thing that your attorney could be pointing out that these people are doing wrong is not complying with those statutes, depending whether the statutes even apply. I mean, okay. 17 will apply. It's a question of whether or not those bulk buyer statutes in particular that kind of impose some of the restrictions that apply to a developer on a, a condo unit owner that buys a batch of, of units within the condo. Um, so I can't really go into depth about it, but the bottom line, my suggestion is have your attorney put together a letter of everything that these people are doing wrong, what they're not complying with, what the potential penalties are, and maybe if you end up with a, hey, this is a $100,000 lawsuit, and by the way, it'll be a class action or a joint lawsuit by these four owners against you, not just me suing you, um, then they might take it seriously. Uh, but I can't say whether they will or not. Well, I appreciate it very much. I pretty much decided I was at that point, but I was, and the last comment I've got is, as attorneys who specialize in this, I encourage you to encourage our lawmakers that, you know, people like me, we have no hopes with the fractured condominium. I mean, it's just, they're taking money out. They don't have reserves. And I don't want to take up everybody else's time, but I, I've just never seen anything so blatantly fraud in my life. And, 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 and again, can't do anything. The answer to that is if you're willing to pursue it via a lawsuit, then a judge might tell them that they need to stop. And, you know, I, I can't say that it'll make a huge difference overall, but at least then some of the money that you're claiming was was essentially defrauded from you, you might get it back. Uh, I, I can't guarantee any of that because we wouldn't right. be willing to help you with it. But, you know, the bottom line is it's that's that's. From what you're describing, it sounds like that's what it's going to take is getting an owner group together and saying, we're not going to take it. Well, I appreciate it, gentlemen. Have a happy holiday and thank like, you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And missed opportunity when you said, we're not going to take it. Anyway. Well, that's exactly what I was referring to. I thought you would <laughs> pick up on it. Isn't D. Snyder a politician now? I think he is. Yes. I think he is. Him and several others that I won't mention by name now. Yeah. Uh, Joel is back with one more question and uh, he's the last hand that I see it. Then we'll go to some of our, uh, we'll go to as many of the typed in questions that we have. Oh, another hand went up a couple more. <laughs> so yeah, I take that back. Well, Joel, we're done. <laughs> go ahead, Joel. Thank you. A very quick question. Is sure. this going to be, is the recording going to be on the KBR website? Yeah. Yeah. This will be here. This is uh, one of our only non-attorney questions so far. Yes. This will be on our website within a couple <laughs> days uh so uh i can answer that uh without the esq after my name yes uh kbrlegal.com then under resources tab thank you okay, you're very welcome it. thanks for hanging out with us my pleasure it's, it's terrific all right next we have oops what did i do lower hand next we have warren warren Please unmute yourself and uh, let us know if you're a condo co-op HOA and uh, Alan is yours. Warren, you need to unmute if you want to ask a question. Going once. Going twice. We will go back. Oh, there you go. There he goes. Nope. <laughs> we will go back to 
Warren, Deborah. Same for you. Go ahead, okay. Deborah. Okay, my question has to do with the new finding policy. I'm sorry, HOA, um, lost office, um, but I'm the community association manager, so I'm okay. asking this in general. Uh, the new finding process is where you have the mandatory meeting now. Can y'all just kind of walk through the process, you know, step by step, and in particular, the pay fine payment is due five days after the notice of the approved has been out. How do you determine that five days? What is the clock ticking? It's when, and, and I'll answer that first and then I'll go through the process, but it's literally when a notice is sent saying the board has approved the fine, the finding committee has approved the fine and you need to pay it. It's five days from the date that that notice is sent. Do you have so to that, send that certified or anything to prove that you sent it on a certain date? I don't believe so, but let me take a look at the statute and I will answer the rest of it while I look this up. Hopefully I can speak and read at the same time. Um, so let's see. Five days after notice is provided by mail or hand delivery. So it doesn't have to be certified mail. You can send a second copy via certified mail, but technically to comply with the statute, it's just regular mail. Now, going back to the process, um, you're going to start with the board deciding to actually levy the fine. That doesn't end the inquiry, of course, because based on what you're saying, you're already aware there is more required. The next thing that happens if the board says, yes, we want to find the owner, is that that finding committee, which needs to be comprised of at least three people that are not directors, officers, managers, or their direct family members, um, those three people need to meet, need to send a notice that says, within 14 days, we will hold a meeting and you can present evidence to say why we should or shouldn't find you. Now, the difference in the statute that you mentioned is last year, or at least up until last year, people would argue that you don't need to necessarily hold the meeting, you need to offer a meeting. My opinion has always been you should hold the meeting regardless. Now it's statutorily required. So what you need to do is after that board meeting occurs and the board decides to levy the fine, at that point, just understand the fine has been levied. It's not owed yet, but it has been levied, meaning the clock starts and that fine begins to accrue. So if we've got an ongoing violation, you're starting the day after that with the first hundred of a thousand dollars or whatever it goes up to under your particular set of governing documents. So once you get to the 14 days, it's already either a thousand or fourteen hundred dollars or whatever it may be. So going back to the process, board meets decides that finding committee will send a notice saying we are holding a finding committee meeting at least 14 days from the date of this notice, and you need to attend it if you want to argue anything other than we should be fining you based on the board's decision. The owner can show up, they can present evidence, they can argue, they can plead for more time, whatever they want to do. Okay, they Now, whether the finding committee provides that time is discretionary. Keep in mind, if they keep providing time, chances are the board is going to remove them because that finding committee serves at the discretion of the board. But once that finding committee meeting takes place, the finding committee is either going to decide to approve the fine, in which case they'll send the notice that you were asking about, and that fine is due within five days after the date that notice is issued. If they decline the fine, fine's no good. You start from square one and the owner never has an obligation to pay it. So that's the process. Now, when it comes to collecting fines and things like that, whether fines are a good idea in the first place, different story. Check out our covenant enforcement webinar if you want more on that. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, looks like Warren lowered his hand. We're going to go to Peter. Peter, let us know if you're a condo HOA or co-op and ask your question with Alan. Yes, please. Alan, I'd like to ask a question about 718, oh, we're a condo, and 718.112 Option C, which requires the board to allow owners to speak at the at the meeting. And it says for each item, in other words, you could speak about each item. Our board doesn't do that. Our board goes through a whole bunch of things. And then they at the end, they say, well, three minutes for open forum. Which one does right? 
Well, it depends whether your board has any kind of policy. And that's another one that I recommend every community adopt as soon as they start working with us is a member participation in meetings policy. And that policy could say that the members have the right to speak either before or after the board votes on everything. Now, technically, the members, in my opinion, have the right to speak on each agenda item for up to three yeah. minutes, unless your policy says that it's more time. Um, but, you know, when you say the members are each given three minutes at the end of the meeting to talk about whatever they want, to me, that's not necessarily following the statute. But keep in mind, it's not the fact that it's after that it isn't following the statute. The statute doesn't specify when the members get to speak. It just specifies that they get to speak. So I personally am not a huge fan of the you get to speak after the decision has been made, because what you're looking for is to give the members their voice. The problem with giving members their voice in advance of making decisions is that, yes, you get more input on it. And that is fantastic. That's what you should hope for. But it also leads to the possibility that because so many people want to speak on a specific agenda item, you don't get to conduct business at the meeting. You don't get to finish what you wanted to accomplish. Gotcha. So it, it is discretionary. But if the board has a written policy in place that says when the members speak, it's not inappropriate to let them speak afterwards. If there's no policy in place, then I, I think it's arguable that they can speak whenever the board allows it. In other words, OK, well, the board is saying the members will get to speak at the meeting, but they won't get to speak until after. I would rather see a written policy in place that says that because then the members know what to expect going forward rather than the decision being made during the meeting or as a practical matter, of course. But the bottom line is, to answer your question in much briefer terms, I don't see a problem with allowing members to answer the question or I'm sorry, to speak after the board has discussed and voted it's just not my preference gotcha you know okay. and i don't have a policy that i can find so i know it's one of the things that i looked up and uh it did just the way they structured it i don't know if the management company set it up that way or but i don't think our board ever um has a policy <laughs> well it might be something that you try and make that determination by a records inspection just to see if there's a policy. But frankly, I don't know that it would alter the outcome of your um, question. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate You're it. Very welcome. Thank you, Peter. Happy holidays for you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you for doing these webinars. Terrific. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Let's do a little bit. What did you want to say? Well, there was a question, you know, you were talking about, uh, the three minutes and 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 letting members speak if they're not on the board and that kind of a thing. There was one of the questions that was submitted in the registration Q&A that is not exactly the same as what was just addressed, but somewhat related. Okay. And it's about asking you to elaborate on the use of workshops. So like, for instance, if, if an, uh, the, the, this commenter mentioned that in the board certification training that you had about a week ago, it sounded like you don't really approve of them. And um, to, to this person anyway, so maybe elaborate a little bit on that, which may shed some light on whether member, how long members speak and the types of questions they could ask at the actual meeting. Is a workshop before a meeting to educate the member, the membership of the association a good idea or not? Well, I mean, I, so if you've watched our board certification courses, or at least mine, you know that the slide that talks about workshops says that they don't exist. And that's my opinion. They're a non-issue. They're not not a thing um, to use common term. It's not a thing under Florida law. There's no such thing as a, a workshop. You can have a discussion. You can have you know a non-meeting. Um, town hall, like a, a like a town hall. Right. A lot of times, what you do is kind of a town hall. But keep in mind, that's not an official meeting of the association. It's just a hey, let's get information out there, or let's gather the the members' thoughts. So. My opinion is, you know, you're not making any decisions at that meeting, either by the members or by the board, but I, I'm not opposed necessarily to having a, hey, everyone can talk for as long as they want, but having it before the board meeting. Once the board meeting starts, you cut all that off and you follow your procedures. So yeah. the short answer is it doesn't exist. That doesn't mean it's not a helpful tool. 
It's right. not a it's not a meeting is the answer. So to call it a workshop to get a the, the problem with it is that many people use the term workshop as a way of getting around holding a meeting. That is wrong. Right. So if you're saying we're going to have a workshop so that we don't have to call a board meeting, I don't agree with that. But if you're yeah. saying we're going to have a town hall meeting so that everyone can voice their opinion, yeah, absolutely. Fantastic idea. That makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense because we would have um, – I met you, you know, way back in the day, you know, during the Winmore, during when I was uh, running a large scale condo and we would have budget workshops before the actual budget meetings would take place where every department head would go to the stage, talk about, you know, the different line items, why he, she, or they are doing what they're doing or submitting what they're doing. And uh, so that everybody would be educated and hopefully make the lives easier for the board members when the board would hold their actual budget meetings. And right. typically it worked pretty well. Yeah, again, I, I think that's a good idea as long as there's no final decisions being made and as long as it's not, you know, a, a quorum of the board discussing association business. And again, even there, I I question whether that constitutes a board meeting to just yeah. discuss without making decisions. But we'll leave that one for another day. Another day. Yeah. Let's get to a couple of the types. And Joel, I see your hand up once again, but I want to get to a couple of people uh, and then we'll we'll come back to you, Joel. Um, for a condo, are we allowed a debit card or a credit card for online janitorial supplies purchases? Debit card, I don't believe is allowed in condos. Uh, a credit card might be okay. And what you might be able to do is a prepaid debit card, which I think might be viewed differently. The goal is just not to have unlimited access to association funds. Right. Uh, so, you know, I, I fully understand the need to have access to online shopping. It's just a matter of, you know, how how are you going to do it? Um, let me just check Chapter 718, because I believe there's a specific statute that talks about debit cards. And Alan, while you're doing that, Warren, Warren, I see you, your hand coming up and down. Warren, if you are ready to ask a question, I know we, we tried earlier, just hit the hand button one time. It'll leave your hand up, and then I can enable voice for you but i saw that you were hitting it constantly and joel you'll, you're on deck you're up next but alan go ahead so the short answer is that the association can't have a debit card in its own name or build directly to the association so that's why i say it, it might be if you're using it for reimbursements and it is not in the association's name for example you know i, I wouldn't recommend putting um association funds onto a debit card for somebody else my suggestion is if that's what you're what you're doing, just have it set up where it's easy to get reimbursed for expenses up to a certain dollar figure and have the individual directors put, you know, the um, the credit card number for their credit card and just get reimbursed with a check like that day or the next day. That's just easier. But you can't have a debit card, period, in the name of a condominium association. And if you use it, frankly, there might be. Um, it's it's maybe prosecuted as credit card fraud is what the statute oh, specifically wow. says. So okay. bottom line, don't do that. Okay. And we do have a hand up and we did promise priority given to hands up. Joel. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious to know what your take is on the ability of a board and let's assume the word, uh, board of uh, pick a number five uh, and, and if a majority of the directors get together to consider uh, competing bids for certain work or other issues that come up, um, at, at what stage is that, um, or is there a risk that that could be either con uh, uh, seen as, or is it a meeting? Um, if a meeting, then you've got a problem. But the idea is to deliberate um, uh, uh, amongst themselves uh, and inform all of the directors so that when the meeting, the official meeting happens, each of them is informed. Alan, that sounds like my argument, doesn't it? So I said I was going to leave this for another time. <laughs> no, that's a tricky question. I, I, I agree. So, no, it's it's a it's an extremely valid and frankly important question that the statute, from my perspective, is about as uh, clear as mud in answering. The problem <laughs> is there's no statutory definition of the term conducting association business because that's what's required in order to have a board meeting. 
There are a lot of law firms and a lot of individual attorneys that will tell you that the second that you get together and start talking about anything association related, you're conducting association business and that's a board meeting. And, you know, even if you're sitting there at happy hour, you've got to notify the members that you're attending happy hour, let them attend and let them interrupt your happy hour discussion. I, I'm more of the opinion that if you are solely gathering information and you are not going to make any decisions, then you have to have the information gathering capacity to not need a 12 hour board meeting to have all those discussions and do that review together of those potential contracts and those bids. So from my perspective, and again, this is my perspective, not necessarily the firm's perspective or even any other attorney within the firm, right. but my perspective is you're conducting association business when you start to have the intent of potentially making decisions. If you are basically saying, okay, this is information gathering only. Now in the past, I've said, well, I think if you're narrowing down options, that's not a board meeting. I'm kind of now of the mind that, and, and I might've even said that as recently as a week ago, but over the weekend, I had a, an in-depth conversation with myself, if that makes sense. And <laughs> my opinion kind of shifted where if you are narrowing down and you're eliminating possible options, technically you are conducting association business from my perspective, because you're saying we are explicitly not going to use this potential contractor. So- Again, if you are talking, Joel, as, as in your example, you are solely gathering facts in order to make a determination of who might work and who might not, and the rationale behind each one of those, and you are only going to eliminate options at a later board meeting, I think you're fine. Now, again, even with that limited criteria, I might be wrong because the statute is not clear on that point. Any again, any conducting of association business, whatever the heck that means, in any particular judge's perspective, is a board meeting and should be noticed properly with the, the members entitled to attend, etc. So the the clear answer is there is no clear answer. There is no clear answer. <laughs> <laughs> good. That, that is a good answer. Thank you. That was that's that's one of very few instances where I will give the typical lawyer answer of it depends. <laughs> and here it really well, depends. I, I could do that, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> so thank you, Joel. Thank you. Take care, Joel. Thank you. Uh we have a question here from the registration uh about commenting on committees. Um, do committees need a 48 hour notice with place, time, and agenda? That's the first part. Do shareholders or members have the right to attend and must minutes be taken? So that's going to depend. Again, the lawyer answer. Um, <laughs> the, the bottom line is it depends what the committee is planning on doing at that meeting and what type of committee it is. There are certain committees under Florida law that must provide notice to at least the member who they're considering doing something to. So if you have a finding committee, a uh, suspension or violation committee, at least the person or persons that might be suspended or fined need to get notice. That doesn't mean that all of the members get notice. Okay, so it really just depends in an HOA if you're going to spend association funds that the committee is deciding on, or if you're going to have an architectural decision. In other words, you had your architectural committee that's meeting to review an application and is going to approve or deny it. Those need to be noticed to the members, need to be open to the members, and need to be um, held in an open forum, and need to be formal committee meetings. Any other committee other than fining and suspensions, technically in an HOA, might not need it. So really, it just depends. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't really have a lot of specificity in the question. If you're on the line and, and want to ask, you know, the type of um, committee that you're talking about in particular, I'd be happy to look at it and answer. But the, the short answer is it just depends on the type of committee. Okay. And Alan, did I understand you correctly earlier that we're not taking serious questions right now? Generally speaking, I'd... I'd rather keep those and and unless if we run out of questions absolutely we'll address them but the bottom line is there's so much information and jeff's roundup article uh other jeff rembaum the guy whose name's on the door not you uh, but his his legal right. update <laughs> so detailed and so clear that frankly yeah. 
I can't do any better than he did in trying to explain it. I think that if there is clarity in the statute, it's also in his legal update. And frankly, I think you'd get more out of that than me sitting here and reiterating what's in there. Um, another, okay, we have an HOA restricted by governing documents to increase, or any other HOA restricted by governing documents to increase monthly fees using the CPI. What other instruments do other HOAs use to fairly increase monthly assessments year to year without having a special assessment? I, did we cover that one earlier? I think we kind of did. Now, the without having a special assessment, um, that sounds like a limitation on increases. The bottom line is, if you need to increase your budget by a million dollars a year, that's what you need to do. Whatever your your monetary needs are for that year, that's what you need to increase it. Um, you know, if, if the members decide that they want to challenge the budget on that basis, they have the right to do that. But I, I would not just presume that you should underfund your budget because you don't want to increase the assessments because that's exactly what will happen. You mentioned a special assessment. That's exactly what you can expect if you underfund the budget. And frankly, special assessments are less likely to lead to payment in my experience. Um, and the reason for that is that people can't necessarily plan ahead for them unless you tell them, hey, we had to underfund the budget because our bylaws are terrible. And so just be prepared. You're going to probably be assessed $1,000 a piece six months from now. Uh, it, that That's just not rather than spreading that among those six months or throughout the year. Uh, I'd rather see that $1,000 spread throughout the year rather than, well, it's going to be $1,000 due in July. Yeah. And um, oh, we have Mike's hand up. Mike, please unmute yourself and you may ask your question. Let us know if your condo HOA co-op and proceed. Mike, I see you've unmuted, but we don't hear you. Going once, <laughs> going twice. Sold. All right. We're going to have to uh, come back to you a little bit later. Raise your hand again if you figure out your audio issue. Um, if the R&Rs conflict, Catherine, I see you. I'll, you're, you're on deck, so stand by. If the R&Rs conflict, I understand that the governing documents rule, correct? I understand that 718 rules, but if the declarations add additional rules like the 8020 for owners and a 55 plus, which one would be the ruling item? Can and should we put rules with money in the R&Rs? So that mixes up about five different concepts. So I'm just going to go through instead of directly answering. Unfortunately, it's probably necessary to clarify how the conflicts work. Now, I'm going to ignore the statutes temporarily. If you're looking at your governing documents, your declaration, your CC&Rs, your R&Rs, unless you're talking about rules and regulations as R&Rs, but your covenants, conditions, and restrictions, your declaration is going to be the top dog when it comes to your documents. Anything that is conflicting in any other document is not going to apply because the declaration controls. Next in line is your articles of incorporation. Next is your bylaws. And then finally, it's anything that your board gets to decide on, which is generally going to be rules and regulations, architectural criteria, things of that nature. I think that's what you mean by R&Rs. If that conflicts with the declaration, it's probably not an enforceable rule. So I hope that clarifies a little bit that the declaration is going to control over everything else, all of your other governing documents. Now, whether the statutes control over your governing documents is going to depend on a bunch of different factors. And that's an analysis that, frankly, your attorney is going to need to do based on the facts and circumstances of your case. But the the issue is generally decided by a case called Kaufman versus Shear, And it basically says if your governing documents say that they incorporate the statutes as amended from time to time, then those changes in the statutes are going to apply. Otherwise, generally speaking, on procedural issues, the statutes might apply on mm -hmm. substantive issues, meaning you're changing the configuration of a lot. You're you're adding rights and responsibilities that someone didn't have before in the new statute. Chances are, if it's a substantive change, then the statute that was in place as of the date the declaration was recorded is the one that's going to control. So again, that's something even a lot of attorneys can't figure out. So my suggestion is if 
if you're not sure what controls, if you're not sure whether you have a conflict between your documents and, and Florida law or internal to the documents, run it by your attorney, let them give you an opinion, and then rely on that opinion. Okay. And I, that question asker is still on the webinar. So if you need more clarification or more specific specificity, uh, raise your hand. Uh, Catherine, please enable your mic. And uh, I see you also had a typed question, but here you are. Go ahead and ask your question. Okay. My type question may have been different. So I'll go with the one that, that comes to mind now. Okay. Um, we recently changed uh, property management companies and in the switchover, um, you know, I was one of the people who facilitated sort of the moving the documents over. Um, do current boards, HOA boards, um, have a right to see previous legal opinions provided to previous boards of directors, say going back five years? The answer is yes, unless the legal opinion pertains to the individual who's now on the board. Okay, that's clear. Thank you. You're welcome. That was a lot easier than all the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to try Mike once again, okay? Mike H., please unmute yourself and you, you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we got you. It sounds like a Verizon. Thank again, hear. thank you. Uh, <laughs> HOA, or excuse me, Co-op 719. Just okay. Co-op. So you're the board, one. Okay. Yes. The board just approved the budget within 115% as allotted by statute. How long does the people that want to challenge the budget have to notify us that they want to bring in their own budget. Generally speaking, they should be doing that at the next uh, member meeting. Um, I I don't. I'm just looking to see if it works the same way as in a condo. Yeah, I mean they they really need a 10 percent of the voting interests need to call Correct. it. So if if that doesn't happen. Um, I don't really see it as an issue, but again, chances are it's by the next member meeting. I, it, there's nothing in the statute that limits it. So technically it could be pretty much at any time throughout the year, but if they don't do it relatively quickly after the budget is adopted, my opinion is it might, first of all, it might be too late. And second of all, you've already been operating under that budget. So what are they going to do? Ask for their assessments back or choose not to pay them and be foreclosed. It, it's just, it would be a logic. The, the time frame for them to challenge it is, is silent. So that's. Right. So logically, they if, if they don't do it, they don't do it. Um, and chances are, keep in mind what needs to be done for them requesting it to even matter. They need to have an alternative budget that they propose and a majority of the voting interest in the community need to vote in favor of that budget. And at that point, you just change the budget to theirs instead of the one that the board adopted. Um, I don't they still don't they still don't have their full 10 percent or about five members short and they're they're trying to get other people to sign on and I I thought there should be some kind of a time frame that we allow them to get get their other five people. Yeah I just I'm, not, I'm if if there's no time frame in the statute then generally it's whenever they want. I don't like it but that's really you know, from what I can see, there's no specific time frame in the statute. So in reality, they can probably do it at any given time. But keep in mind, all that requires if they do meet the 10 percent is that you hold a meeting for the purpose of having the members vote on an alternative budget. If they don't present an alternative budget, then their attempt fails. If they don't get the majority, keep in mind, they're having trouble getting 10 percent of the members to sign off. What's the likelihood that they're going to get a majority of the entire membership to vote in favor of an alternative budget? Seems low to me. All right. Thank you for it. it, it it's all about reserves. They don't want to fund reserves. But well, I mean, that's what it's all about. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Make it a great day. Take care. We have a question here. We're going to, uh, we have about 15 minutes left in our advertised time, so we'll get to as many questions as we have now uh, with the questions that were typed in. So I'm going to disable the hand raising and we're gonna just stick with, in other words, I'm gonna ignore the hand raising for now. We've done a bunch of those, no hands up now. Let's go to the typed in questions. May do that, Jeff, let me just yeah. jump back in because Mike kind of cut off what I was gonna sure. say. Because sure. 
frankly, I think that the most important part of what he was looking at is the one that he didn't mention until he was signing off. Um, Mike, reserves don't count in that calculation of 115%. The statute's clear on that. Okay. So if they're arguing that if your your relatively small member group is arguing that the budget was inappropriate or should be replaced because it's 115% or more than 115% of the last year's budget, but that's based on an increase in mandatory reserves or an increase in reserves, those reserves don't count towards the 115%. Okay. That's directly in the statute. So. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that before we move on, because I think it changes the answer. Okay. And with the questions that we're going to read from the registration, I'm going to do my best to make sure it's from people who are still on the call, who are still on the webinar right now. So uh, Richard's question is, may taxes on interest earned on reserve funds be paid out of the reserve funds? Funds. You're, if you're not for profit, I don't know that there are taxes payable on that money. So, I mean, I I would anticipate that that is an expense of the association if you're paying any taxes, but I would look into whether or not you should be obligated to pay them. Uh, I, I'm not a tax attorney, so I can't give legal advice, even if I was your attorney yeah. on tax issues. But, um, you know, as a from the perspective of an HOA condo practitioner, chances are you can only use the reserve funds for the purpose they're intended, for the asset they're intended. My guess is if you ended up earning that interest and you, you're paying taxes on it, that would come out of the general association coffers rather than the reserve account. Okay. And this one, this next one sounds too specific. I'm going to read it and you're going to, and if it is just say, we don't know the docs, Jeff, move on. Can an HOA board member, can HOA board members re remove a bench that's on the property without a vote from the community? There was nothing wrong with the bench. That just sounds like it's, it's it's generally a material alteration issue in an HOA. You generally don't have to go to the members to make those kind of changes. Okay. You know, if there's any kind of waste by the association, that might be a separate issue. But to just move a bench that was there, unless there's something in the declaration that requires you to have that bench, chances are you have the right to move it. That's kind of what I was getting at. There might be something in there, but usually not. Can board members, uh, same person, can board members decide on and purchase a message board? without the community, I guess like a bulletin board or a digital display sign or something without okay. the community vote? Yeah, unless, like there's, so much, right? uh, unless there's a limitation for what you can spend without a member vote, you know, sometimes it's five grand. I've, I haven't seen anywhere. It's like the 150, $200 that that would probably cost. Yeah. Uh, but, but if there's a, an expenditure limitation that requires a member vote, that'd be the only time I would anticipate you would need a member vote before you can buy and install that kind of bulletin board for the same reasons we just discussed. It, mm -hmm. it may be a material alteration of common areas, which is generally what you'd be looking at, but absent something in the governing documents, you can make those types of material alterations without a member vote in an HOA. Condo is different. Okay. Um, are you able to answer this one? What does it mean when an insurance carrier changes the deductible from annual to per named storm? Is that well, something for another? It, it, no, I mean, it's, it's an insurance issue. And what that would mean is that instead of a max amount you're paying out of pocket throughout the year, they're basically saying, well, now you have a maximum out of pocket that you'll pay per named storm. In other words, you know, if you had $2,000 and that's a very low figure, but that's your, your deductible for the year and you won't exceed that no matter what you spend, then that's your max out of pocket for the year. If they're changing it to per named storm and there are five per na five named storms in the state of Florida that hit your community, and you have separate damages from each one that you're submitting claims for, then technically you could be paying five times 10 or five times 2000, which is 10 grand. So that okay. would be the difference. I can't, I'm not frankly well-versed enough in the insurance sure. industry in and of itself to go through that in detail, but that's what it means. Okay. And this is one, this is one where I want to give an answer to see if I think the way you think before you answer it. All right, for go for it. For new incoming HOA or master association directors with no experience with associations, besides reading the articles of incorporation, the declaration of the bylaws, which three to five webinars do you recommend be required each board member attend? 
Now, I know we have to say the board member certification class. That goes without saying. But uh, I would guess that you're going to mention, and again, don't be afraid to say, Jeff, you don't know what the heck you're talking about. Well, I'll say that anyway. <laughs> Why updating the documents of your association is critically important, like stepping up into the present. That's a really good one. Is that one you, you would recommend? Because that's one that I usually recommend to others. I'd say that's top five easily. Okay. And then All right, enforcement's another important one because so many people don't understand why they have the obligation to actually enforce the covenants. They say, we want to be nice to our members. We don't want to be a bunch of, of you know, HOA problem children, so to right. speak. Right. Uh, I And also the way that enforcement is done. I often have people saying, oh my gosh, I had no idea that you could do it that way in a way that actually gets us a resolution rather than telling people what they have to do and doing nothing about it. Um, collection is another very important one because I think right. that if you don't do your collection work and you're again, sitting there and saying, we want to work with our owners, but you're not holding them to any kind of standard other than working with them. You're basically guaranteeing that you're not going to have the funds to properly operate and maintain your community. Or we had a question about bad debt earlier, that bad debt category on your budget is going to be thousands upon thousands of dollars. Right. And, you know, I've worked with communities in the past that had 10,000 lots and their bad debt was thousands of dollars. And, you know, you, you take it from a $300,000 accounts receivable down to 50 grand in the course of two years. And all of a sudden they don't have to assess everyone quite so much. So I think those, I, I think the board cert, the collection and covenant enforcement are some of the major ones. And yes, I absolutely think that governing documents is important. The fair housing one is also important. Oh yeah. Animals or pets. Yeah. Here's the other thing. What it requires and what it will teach you is to know enough to know when you need to reach out to counsel about those issues. Cause that's yeah. the most important thing you can do is, is not screw it up. Okay. But those are the ones I would consider my top five. Cool. Gail, um, when it comes to structural engineer firms looking for competent, honest ones, your best bet is to look with an organization like the Community Associations Institute. Take a look at uh, some of the sponsors and business partners that belong with them. You can go to CA, depending on where you are, just look up your local CAI chapter and see uh, the members that are the uh, business partner members that are there for structural engineer firms. Uh, we have another question. How do you encourage everyone to sign up for electronic voting. So what, I guess, what are some techniques that you've seen associations perform I mean, to encourage? Right. It's not really the association that should be doing that. If you've got a good vendor, most of the vendors that I've worked with in the past, they'll go out and try and get everyone on board because yeah. they make more money for each person that they sign up sometimes, depending on the way that their contract works. Um, but, you know, things that you can explain to people is one, you'll never need to get or mail in a ballot ever again for this community. You can literally take care of this on your phone. Two, you'll have a voice. There's no risk of someone, you know, saying your ballot's not valid or inadvertently losing it or anything like that. And I'm not implying any kind of voter fraud, but the bottom line is it's just so much easier to vote and get access to these these um, voting rights and use them if you go and, and sign up for electronic voting if your community is using it. So that's the, the ease of use, I think, is the best part of it. You know, you, you can either fill out a proxy form, sign it um, in some communities, get it notarized so that they can prove that it's really you signing it and hand it off to somebody else. Or you can click a couple buttons on your phone and be done with your vote and have voted yourself with no risk that someone else is going to vote in a way that you didn't anticipate or desire. Okay. So I think that's the best I can do is say, work with a work with a vendor who part of their service is to do that job for you. Okay. Um, this is an interesting one. Cause I, I also come from a background where we had over 120 clubs in the community uh, as a community that requires certified clubs, and I guess certified means that they are an officially recognized club of the association. They have a charter, they have their own bylaws, that kind of a thing, probably likely a bank account for club events and funds. So as a community that requires certified clubs to invite the entire community to events held in our clubhouse, this club speaks a different language and is asking to host an event that is not in English. Can we insist on English to ensure all can participate. 
I mean, you can try is my, my, my answer. Well, bottom line is if you're, if, if you're insisting on English as the primary language, then really all that they need to do is have someone translate the announcements and they can still really conduct the meeting in Spanish for the most part. I, 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 Alan, Alan, my, my question here, you know, I'm going to piggyback on this because this is so interesting to me that um, a community allows clubs and they form a charter for the club to be, it's an officially recognized club by Association X, whatever the association is. And they have to allow anybody to join the club. Okay. Now, when you think about joining a club, you're going to learn about the club and what they're going to be doing. You know, let's say it's the bowling club. You go to the bowling event and you say, I don't want to bowl. I want to play softball. Isn't that the same thing? If you know the club is going to be, if it's the the Spanish club, the Spanish speaking club, is it reasonable to say we have to do it in English? I don't think it's reasonable. The question is whether it's legal, because yeah. what, what we're looking at is not necessarily, is it something we have to do right. to require that it be in English? It's it's can we do it so that everyone is able to participate? And the answer is, frankly, I don't know offhand. And, yeah. and I know that the law will directly provide an answer. Hopefully the policy that requires that all of these clubs be actually chartered or whatever the, the term was um, by the association will clarify that it, you know, all of the club functions that are held in that clubhouse or wherever it is are going to be held in English. But if not, I, I don't really see a basis to say everything needs to be in English. Yeah. That, that's kind of, kind of the law you know it's very vague and uh it, it's just that what that one hit home a little bit when i saw that one on there because uh if a club is advertised properly to the community that's when you decide whether you want to join that particular club or not so everybody in the community is given the opportunity to join the club if they want to uh and then club members could bring a guest if they want to but it doesn't mean you're going to enjoy or understand or want to participate in everything they're doing so it's just yeah it's open for interpretation I don't see holding a lang uh, a meeting in the language of the club as being a prohibitive action. You're basically right. saying this is what this club does. Right. You're welcome to join. If you what don't, they do. it, that's on you. Right. And so it would be reasonable for the club to properly advertise what they do and what they're all about, and then people can make informed decisions whether they want to participate or not. That would be my opinion. Without you know any more specificity as to what these governing documents say or require. Yeah. And you said the word specificity a lot easier than I did. Way to go. <laughs> it's one uh, that's unfortunately used pretty frequently. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last question of the folks that are still in attendance here of the people who typed it in. Uh, can a president be or do the treasurer position as well? Generally, I don't see any prohibition on it unless your bylaws say otherwise. Okay. And then, if so, can the president keep the can the president keep the association's seal? Um, usually, that would be the secretary, but I don't necessarily see a problem with it. Again, unless your bylaws say otherwise. Okay. Uh, when it comes to collect blah blah blah, what procedure should the board? That's not pertinent. Should the board? Okay, this is interesting. This is, has to do with email opt in communications, you know, opting in for email communications. Should the board email all meetings to all owners? I don't see any reason not to send a, a blast. Just understand that you're still going to have to provide the same regular notice via mail or posting or whatever to anyone that hasn't a, agreed to adopt electronic notices. So yes, I would send it because you're just giving more notice than is required if you're providing notice in that way. Just understand it's not going to be sufficient notice under Florida law or under your governing documents if those individuals haven't agreed to accept notices that way from the association. Well, all right. We got through pretty much everything. Alan, wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks to everybody who took the time to ask your questions, type in your questions, and hang out with us for the full 90 minutes. Uh, any parting words and the best way to reach you, sir? Sure. Uh, well, again, like Jeff mentioned, thank you all for attending. Um, this was uh, the first just open Q&A we've done, at least that I've done. Uh, I know that usually there's at least a topic that we're talking about for the day, and I think we might do that in the future, but I'm, I'm glad that uh, 
all of you decided to stick around for this one. I appreciate you all showing up today. My email address is the easiest way to reach me. It's as at kbrlegal.com. Uh, and if anyone wants just some daily tips on management of communities, dealing with community associations, how to be a better attorney, et cetera, feel welcome to follow me on LinkedIn. That's really where I share that information. Other than these important educational sessions that I try to teach as regularly as human poss humanly possible along with Jeff for K Bender Rambaum. Uh, and again, if you don't have an attorney, you don't like your attorney, or your attorney's not being as responsive as you'd like, or if you just want a second opinion or just someone else you can turn to whenever you need to, do feel welcome to reach out to me, reach out to the firm. Um, you know, the, working with community associations is all we really do. And we'd be happy to work with yours if you have the need. So thank you all. And Jeff, I'll turn it over to you and I'm going to head out so I can drive up to Georgia today. Safe travels, my friend. Happy holidays. And with that said, happy holidays to all of you as well. Be safe and uh, check out kbrlegal.com. Take care, Alan. I know you got to get out of here. Check out kbrlegal.com and then navigate to our event calendar. You can see what else we have coming up uh, for the rest of this month, which isn't much <laughs> with the holidays upon us. But January is looking pretty full and February is going to be populated over the next several days as well. So with that said, uh, make it a great day, everybody. Have a happy and safe and healthy holiday season for you and all of your loved ones. Thank you very much. See you soon.